Good morning. I am Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett. I proudly represent the 30th Congressional District here in Dallas, Texas. But prior to joining Congress, I had the esteemed honor of absolutely having an opportunity to practice law. Practice law in the states of Texas, Arkansas, both state and federal courts. And so there are four words that come to mind when I think about practicing law. Equal justice under law. Unfortunately, for a very long time, many of us have been seeking that equal justice under law. It is that seeking that took me to Congress in the first place, because unfortunately, we know that these court systems, as they've been created, have not always been fair for everyone. There is no exception about the fairness that we see or the lack thereof in our country right now in our highest court. So let's just get to it. We know that these courts historically have not looked out for black or brown people. We know that when they interpret the Constitution, unfortunately, there are just certain people that they never, ever contemplated caring about. And so when we think about what our court looks like right now, and we think about where our country is right now, I fortunately or unfortunately served in the Texas House last session. That session, Texas led this country on a very dangerous path. That dangerous path went out after every right that every woman in this country should be guaranteed under law. They took our reproductive rights away from us and they could care less. Now historically, because we have multiple branches of government, we would have anticipated that we could rely upon our judicial branch to follow this little thing we call precedence and look to Roe v. Wade Another case that actually came out of Dallas, Texas, out of my district. Henry Wade was the district attorney in Dallas County when that case came about. Unfortunately, at some point in time, seemingly this court has lost its way. That's why, because we know precedence is a real thing. The court has been expanded before and right now should not be an exception. It should absolutely be the time to expand the court. Because right now, as far as I'm concerned, we have illegitimate justices in the first place. We know that President Obama was denied his ability to appoint a justice of his choosing. We also know that the precedence that was used to deny President Obama was completely ignored when it came time to take RBG's spot on the court. Beyond all of this, we know that this court is rogue. Right now, we're in Dallas, and I'm sure you have heard of a man by the name of Harlan Crow, a man that is right here in Dallas. You've heard of Harlan Crow because of his relationship with one of our justices, his relationship that has come under scrutiny only by those that care anything about ethics. We used to abide by a little thing when I was allowed to practice law that basically said, if it appears to be problematic, then it probably is problematic. Well, from what I can tell, it looks a little problematic. Not making any official allegations, but I'm sure that there is enough that we should be allowed to investigate. And at a very minimum, we should be pushing every elected official on the federal level to make sure that we, at a very minimum, reform the court. Because the reason that the approval rating for the court is so low it's because while we've always known that there have been systemic issues with the court, it's now becoming so apparent that it's beyond just the systemic issues. There is real corruption and ethical concerns that we have as well. We don't trust the highest court in the land, and that's exactly why we need to expand the court, we need to add some more justices, and we need to hopefully get this court back on track, which in turn means that we get our country back on track. With that, I now have the absolute honor and pleasure of introducing, I want to make sure her title is correct, y'all, <laughs> so bear with me. I am introducing Miss Elise Hogue. She is the partner slash purpose, yeah, she's the partner <laughs> at Purpose, former president of NARAL, Pro-Choice America. Thank you to Congresswoman Crockett and 
all of my other co-speakers here today. Um, this is my hometown. I was born and raised in Dallas, Texas, and I am a proud Texan, um, even though it sometimes becomes hard due to the power exerted from um, higher ups. Um, it is not coincidental that I chose to travel here, not just to see my family, but also to be in the backyard of the latest symbol of the courts, the highest court in the land's corruption, and that's Harlan Crow. Harlan Crow and his dealings with Justice Clarence Thomas are both um, confounding and disturbing, but they're also symbolic. They're symbolic of a line of actions that have been taken in the recent decade to seize control of the court and undermine its legitimacy. This comes on top of, as the good Congresswoman said, a rushed confirmation for Amy Coney Barrett, a botched and um, suspect investigation into Justice Kavanaugh's um, alleged sexual assault, and the, uh, the refusal to give Obama, President Obama's nominee, Merrick Garland, the hearing. These are not accidental. These are an attempt to seize control of one of the branches of government to undo what have been decades of progress through the judiciary. The results have been devastating, not just devastating to reproductive rights, which is where I dedicated my life for the last decade, but to voting rights, to the rights of workers and other historically marginalized people. The results are devastating to legitimacy of the court, the confidence of many Americans in the ideal that we can advance our rights through a legal system when even sometimes our legislative branch is failing us as it is here in Texas. The court that was once symbolic of hard won justice, hard -won justice and social progress through Brown and versus Board of Education, Roe v. Wade and Obergefell now stands at the precipice of being on the forefront of eliminating rights, of undermining justice, and of demolishing equality. It's not something we can afford. It's not something we can afford for the millions of Americans who are in the crosshairs, but it's also not something we can afford for a belief in democracy at a critical moment in this country's history. Now this court feels like an instrument of self-dealing and doubt in democracy, but it doesn't have to be this way. The founders wrote into the Constitution the ability, not just of the separation of powers, but of checks and balances. There was a, an authority of the legislative branch to make sure that power was not just corrupting and absolute power was not corrupting absolutely, and that is why they have the ability to expand the court. This is historic. It has happened before. It is common sense when we care about our democracy to take action to restore legitimacy and trust in one of the most sacred institutions in this country. We have to do it. We have to do it for the people. We have to do it for progress. And we have to do it for the future of democracy in our country. So with that, I'd like to introduce someone who is one of my primary inspirations in the world. She was my um, vice chair at NARAL Pro-Choice America. She is an incredible um, political analyst and operative. She's advised Hillary Clinton and Stacey Abrams. She's a passionate advocate, and she's my friend, Karen Finney. do that. Okay. So why are we here? We are here because our democracy is being undermined by a court that is out of control. It is over politicized. And now it is rampant with corruption. This culture of corruption that we have that has been exposed in terms of the nature of the relationship between Harlan Crow and Clarence Thomas is shameful. And yet, Clarence Thomas says he doesn't, it was just hospitality. Harlan Crow says 
he's not going to go talk to the Senate Judiciary Committee. He doesn't recognize their authority. Literally just said that. So I say that is a culture of corruption. You cannot, you know, lavish a Supreme Court justice who should not be able to, rather, with trips and, uh, you know, being on fancy jets and paying for their grand ne their nephew's very expensive private school. When things like that are happening or donating half a million dollars to a Tea Party organization that, the, that Clarence Thomas's wife, Ginny, founded. When you see that happening and you see what has been happening, as my other panelists have talked about in the court, where wealthy people are using their access to change the laws to benefit them, where, while the rest of us are losing our rights. I'm 55 years old. I have less rights today than I did as a child. Why? Because the Supreme Court of the United States of America says, I can't be trusted to make my own decisions about my body. And I'll tell you, as a black woman, I find that particularly despicable because there was a time in this country where as black women, we didn't control anything in our bodies. And now, instead of expanding rights, the court is taking those rights away. And let's be clear, Clarence Thomas, he wants to go farther. So we see this corruption. We see the chaos that it is creating. And it is undermining the very promise of equal justice under law for everyone. We can't let it stand. And we don't have to. That's why we're here. We want people to know talk to your members of Congress, because Congress does have the authority to expand the court. Congress does have the authority to help impose real ethics. We need real reform. I mean, imagine, you know, someone gives you hundreds and thousands of dollars of, you know, trips and favors, and you say, I didn't think I had to report it. I didn't think I needed to tell anybody. Really? That just doesn't even, I mean, would you, would you believe that if your child said that to you? Of course you wouldn't. We shouldn't either, and we don't have to stand for it. So we want to make sure that everybody understands we can change the courts, we can make it more fair, more just, we can expand the numbers, and we can bring real ethics reform to this court. Now it is my honor to introduce Wanda Mosley from Black Voters Matter. as tall as Karen. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Wanda Mosley, National Field Director of Black Voters Matter. Wow, here I am still in Texas. It's still hot. But again, I am I'm honored to be here with these wonderful women who are, like myself, sick and tired of what we are seeing coming out of D.C., with the exception of Congresswoman <laughs> Crockett here. But, you know, I, I'd mentioned when we were in Houston that, that any chance, anytime I have a chance to come to Texas for a work trip, it's joyful because this is my birth state. In fact, I was born at Parkland, just like Elise, right up the street. I'm a TCU graduate, so I have roots here in this state. Or as we like to say in the hood, I got skin in the game. I've got family here. I'm meeting up with a second, third cousin that I've never met right after this. And so all that to say, all the things that I'm seeing coming out of the state of Texas are deeply disturbing. And if we're just being honest, a lot of the bad bills we see, Congresswoman, are copy and paste from other states. So it makes me think, it makes me wonder, do these folks get together at a time and have meetings and talk about how they're going to undermine democracy and reclaim power that they feel is owed to them and should only be held by them. I don't know, maybe some all-male retreat out in California somewhere that's real exclusive. You got to know a billionaire or two to get in. Justice Thomas. Yes, let's talk about that. Justice Thomas, who hails from the state of Georgia, where I call home now. Decades of free trips estimated to be valued at over half a million dollars. But again, this is just out of generosity, right? No one asked for it. We don't expect anything in return. 
And if you believe that, I will be selling you this baseball field after this uh, press conference for a very reasonable price. Because we know all of that is not true. We know all of this is part and parcel for undermanding the highest court in the land so that that paves the way for states to do what they've done, pass legislation that further suppresses the rights of everyday citizens, everyday folks, folks who don't know billionaires. I don't know billionaires. I don't know any millionaires. I maybe know a couple thousandaires. That's about it. That's the extent of my access to the Supreme Court of the United States. That's it. But here we are in Texas, when we think about all the bills that have come out of the state legislature, which, sister, I know you're glad you're not there anymore, because it's just awful. I mean, we're talking about legislation, I can't even believe I'm going to say this, that will train K through 12 students how to basically triage in their elementary schools, which basically says we're seeding, they, I'm sorry, they are seeding that there will be any kind of gun control. There will be nothing legislatively in place to protect children. So imagine, if you will, kindergarten students tying tourniquets with their socks. Think about bulletproof, bulletproof backpacks. That's what the Texas state legislature is basically saying that we need instead of gun control. I think about a story I heard about a woman in Texas who was pregnant and the fetus was no longer viable. I think that's the term that we use. And she could not find a health care provider to give her the ability to keep her body safe. Because carrying a fetus, and if I'm wrong, someone check me because this is y'all's y'all's lane, you know, for two, three weeks is a danger to the woman's health and her very life. But that's where we are. Because the Supreme Court of the United States, which we used to be able to rely on for some level of protection when the state acted against us, is no longer there for us. Those days are long gone. But there is a remedy. We can expand the court. There is precedent. There's that word again for it. It has been done. We're not asking for anything radical. But what we are asking for is somebody, please, come and protect our most basic rights, access to health care, gender-affirming care for young people. This state passed something like 50, they introduced something like 50 different bills to attack transgender youth. I remember hearing a mother say, you know, I am, I'm glad to have a daughter in therapy who is working through her life than a son I visit at a cemetery. Think about that. Because that's where we are. Attacks on voting rights across the country. You know, I think about the state of Georgia, which I now call home. We have a former staff member and two vol three volunteers from 2020 who faced charges from the state for distributing snacks and water. Again, y'all, it's hot in Texas and Georgia and all across the South. And it's only going to get hotter if you believe in science, and if you believe climate change is real, and if you believe scientists when they say stop saying extreme weather because this is just the weather. And so when you create a situation where, let's start with, we don't have a livable wage. We now have people who pass laws to, to, to keep us, to bar us from the ballot box, to make it harder to vote. And now we're asking people to stand in line at a place like this where there's asphalt, on a hot fall day, because now it's hot in the fall, for six, eight, nine hours. We have folks in this country who cannot afford to vote, and their health will prevent them from voting. And so instead of championing progressive laws like Harris County had with drive-through polling precincts, 24-hour ballots, uh, voting precincts during a pandemic, they have now been stripped of their powers, basically, in Harris County to manage their own elections, all predicated on the big lie. And then let's talk about some of the smaller lies here in Texas. This whole idea that there were issues in 2020 because polling precincts opened late and there wasn't paper. 68 out of 781 didn't have paper. During a time where we're still working through supply chain, that's actually not that bad when you think about it. But that was enough for Republicans in the state legislature in Austin to swoop in and seize control.
Because, again, it all goes back to that agenda at that all-male retreat out in California to take power from people who are not white male landowners in the United States. So that's where we are. The Black Voters Matter Fund is calling for expansion of the court. We are proud to stand in solidarity with our just majority coalition partners. And now I have the honor of bringing forth to you again, Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett. Thank you. Fantastic. <laughs> Questions? Yes, Jessica. <laughs> You know, uh, a lot of people always want to kind of look to the president, and I think that that's one of the things that becomes a little misleading when it's time to vote. Because at the end of the day, the president can use his bully pulpit, that is true. But as far as getting legislation to him, it takes the Senate, it takes the House. And people keep saying, how is it that y'all had control of the House, the Senate, the White House, and you still never protected reproductive freedom? Let me tell you, there's still not enough pressure on the Senate. The Senate is our biggest problem. Once we take the House back, everything's all good. We always get our legislation moved through the House, but the Senate is where we have problems. The Senate is also where we have to deal with blue slips. So when we're talking about these federal appointments, people don't understand that on the trial court level, the trial court judge that decided he was going to write that idiotic opinion as it relates to member Pristone, right? That was a Texas judge. He was able to get on that bench because when we have vacancies in the state of Texas on the trial court level, they just sit there until a Republican comes in. So you only end up with Republican appointees when it comes to our trial court, once again, because of a Senate tradition. This isn't even law. And when we start talking about um, even uh, when we start talking about passing any legislation through the Senate, we know we've got the filibuster, right? And so, honestly, where I want the pressure to be is in the Senate. What I want people in Texas to do is show up and kick out our worthless junior senator. I need pressure to be there. I need the president to kind of focus on continuing to build a consensus. I think it's the one thing that he's really good on. To be perfectly honest, we know that we just had the fight on the debt ceiling this past week. I voted against it. There's a little drama. Just so everybody knows, I would have absolutely voted for it if it meant that my vote was necessary. But the point is, the president built a consensus, and that's what he's good at, good at doing, whether it's in the House or in the Senate. Unfortunately, these are not consensus building items. These are items where you, when you have the majority, you have to make sure you exemplify your strength. I'll just, I'm sorry, I'll just add really quickly because you took the words right out of my mouth. The filibuster. We need to end the filibuster. In 2021, after historic wins in Georgia that placed two Democratic senators in D.C., Black Voters Matter, DFAD, Declaration for American De Democracy, and numerous other organizations traveled to D.C. week after week after week, demanding the end of the filibuster and demanding our protection of our voting rights. You know, this filibuster is what allows one or two senators, one or two, who I will not name, to hold the rest of the United States Senate hostage and basically all levers of federal government. Co-equal branches suddenly are not co-equal because of something like the filibuster. So if we can end the filibuster to answer your question, that's what I'd like to see. That's one step in the right direction, along with expansion of the Supreme Court. Uh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> we can start there. Listen, uh, we know that we've had an embattled AG for a very long time. He's been under indictment for almost a decade, and that wasn't enough to move people, right? It's just like we see that the former president is still leading in the Republican primary, even though he is under indictment right now. He most likely will be facing additional indictments. Um, what moved the needle was money again. Money. Money is the only thing that ever moves the needle for certain people. And so essentially what we saw was our corrupt AG, and yes, I will go ahead and proclaim that one, regardless as to whether or not 
the Senate does their job and actually convicts him, I know enough to know that you don't have these indictments and run from them, you know, for years, almost a decade. He's definitely not sought a speedy trial on that, but I'm sure he's really trying to get in as soon as he can uh, as it relates to getting his trial in the Senate. Um, we know that he has done enough to not be worthy of, of, of representing us. We know that he also was under investigation with the State Bar of Texas because he was literally lying in pleadings as it relates to trying to overturn the election with Trump, which is why Trump is sticking with him, because he was one of his best soldiers. But ultimately, there were whistleblowers. For anyone who doesn't know what a whistleblower is, that is somebody who snitches on someone who is doing something wrong. So there's whistleblowers that needed to be paid off, meaning you did something wrong, and you did it in your official capacity. Well, one thing we as Texans should not do is pay off your official wrongdoings. If he had not sought that $3.2 million of taxpayer dollars from somebody who supposedly is fiscally conservative, if he had not done that to pay off his misdeeds, then honestly he would not be getting impeached. But he got impeached, and for people that don't understand and are attacking the Republicans, please stop. And I never thought I'd say that, but please stop, because here's the deal. We have said over and over and over, you can indict a ham sandwich. The process that happened in the state house was nothing more than an indictment. That's why it was a lower bar. That's why it only required 50%. That's why you didn't have to have people testifying under oath. That's why he's not necessarily guaranteed a defense, because it's the equivalent of an indictment. When we look at our indictment process in this country, if you're not challenging that, then don't challenge this impeachment, because that is done in secret. All indictments are done in secret. You didn't learn about Trump's indictments until they came out. It is always done in secret. The difference is this trial will be very public. You will be able to see people testifying under oath. You will be able to hear, and he has his attorneys, as y'all saw, and they will be defending him. So the process that's been taken is one of courage. For once, we saw some courage, and we saw Republicans doing the right thing. And I will be the first, even as a progressive, to say I appreciate when people just do their daggone jobs and do the right thing, and this is one of the few examples. No. <laughs> I mean, it won't. <laughs> this was kind of one of those uh, once-in-a-lifetime opportunities. And, and I'll be clear, in the House, as bad as it is, because we've talked about voting rights, and we know that Texas was also leading that charge, we know that there were warrants put out for our arrest when we decided to leave the state to stop the passage of the terrible voter suppression laws. And, and this session, they moved on to voter subversion, to be clear. Um, they want to be able to overturn the elections, but only in those large, blue, urban spaces is, you know, it's Harris County right now, but it'll expand to everything that's blue. Um, nevertheless, what, what we saw was them trying to protect money. What we saw was them saying, we don't know how we're going to explain away $3.2 million when we've not invested more in our teachers. Teachers have not received a bump in their pay. We know that we're in a teacher crisis right now. We were down over 10,000 teachers just two years ago, right? And so people aren't wanting to go into the profession. We know when we talk about guns that they passed legislation arming all the teachers, AFT and everybody was against that because now we're adding more guns to the classroom. Now we know that children are the, the number one reason for children dying is at the hands of guns. That's not necessarily a mass shooting all the time. We also know that there's these accidental gun deaths. So it's really um, incomprehensible what they're asking teachers to do because now you got to go and be, uh, you know, Mr. Harry or somebody. I mean, you got to go in and you have to be the one that is going to shoot if somebody comes in. And I, I think that that is when people sign up to teach, that's not what they sign up for. So as we look at the legislation that's coming through and as we are currently celebrating Pride Month, the beginning of it, and them going after drag queens, I don't think we'll ever get on the same page about what the priorities should be. Um, but for once, and once again, it was money. So if there's ever another money situation, then maybe so. But they were going to get ate up regardless. If they didn't go after him, then their opponents would go after them explaining that we had this historic surplus 
and they decided to pay off the misgivings and the wrongdoings of the attorney general instead of supporting people with property tax relief, mm -hmm. supporting people so that they would decide to go into the schools and teach, supporting us by making sure that we're giving more money because we haven't expanded upon access to health care. And so we're going to invest in our community health care centers. So this was them, in my opinion, really trying to save their butts because it could go either way. So unfortunately, I don't see very much else happening. You'll, you'll see it from the progressives, for sure. Um, I don't think you'll see it from everyone. Um, because when you're talking about things like expanding the court, there's so many layers, and it's such a complex message. And Democrats got to keep it simple. Um, Republicans keep it simple. We've got to keep it simple. People like me, it will be the heart of our election because it's a primary election. But when you start talking about people that are in uh, fights where it's gonna be a general election, the average general voter, this isn't kind of one of their big uh, ticket items. I will tell you that we consistently get briefed on polling to find out where the country is right now. Right now, guns are number one. It doesn't matter your age, your sex, your religion, guns are number one. Number two is reproductive freedom. And that's actually coming across the spectrum, right? Because they have gone so far on the extreme. I mean, if you really think back, you don't really remember Democrats going out there and saying we're pro-choice, 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 right? It wasn't really the, the calling card of the average Democrat. But at the end of the day, we've always been on the pro-choice side. But the fact that we were out front, the fact that we were winning elections and people were running and that was the only thing they were running on, that tells you where we are. We've got Republicans in different states that are elected that are saying this is too much. Even Nancy Mace, if you know who she is. Nancy Mace even says, this is too far. So number one will be guns. Number two is going to absolutely be reproductive freedom. And we know that the court ties into all of it.